helping us with this series. Uh, we have Sean Walter here tonight from the Britain Area Sports Commission. Thank you very much, Sean. <laughs> we have the, uh, the Hilton Garden Inn that called us today. They've had a few complaints that Joey's staying over there, so we can't stay, send anyone over there anymore. So thanks a lot, Joey. Um, and they've, uh, they've helped us out. Motorworks Brewery is going to be serving some beer afterwards. Uh, and also we have uh, Scene Magazine uh, helping us out for, to promote this series. Bright House Sports Network uh, has been helping us out as well, so we appreciate all the support. And today, uh, over at Gold Coast Eagle, they hosted our NBA group, so we appreciate that. Um, and before we get started, if you walked in, you probably saw some really cool sport bikes out front. Uh, well, we have tonight a racer that's raced at Daytona for the last 10 years. We have uh, Bob Fisher from Roaring Toys that brought his bikes. Uh, he's won numerous championships at Daytona. And uh, a great entrepreneur and uh, a great example for our, uh, our young students here. And he distributes his parts worldwide and has sit downs with Mr. Suzuki and has done bikes for numerous celebrities and Joey's favorite rapper, Ludacris, as well. He did a bike for and a lot of other people. So at uh, further ado, I want to introduce uh, Dean Robert Anderson from our College of Business. Thank you. OK, they gave me a script, and I'll try to follow it, but I'm not good at reading. Uh, I'd rather talk. Um, one of the things that I want to announce very quickly is a few things that's happened here on campus. Uh, as you know, uh, we are part of the USF system, which consists of the campuses in Tampa, St. Petersburg, and here. And I believe it was two years, no, three years ago, this campus was separately accredited by SACS, which is the accrediting body for all uh, universities and colleges in the Southeast. So we are a freestanding, independent, pay your own bills campus. Uh, that led to uh, the College of Business, uh, again, has been accredited since we've been offering programs here, but it was under the umbrella of the Tampa campus. And last year, uh, I believe in March, we were officially notified that this College of Business is separately accredited by AACSB, which accredits quality programs, and we are now one of we're in the 5% of all business programs in the world that has this accreditation. So this is something that's very, very special for us. I think one of the things that uh, I'm gonna enjoy listening to Joey is, I got to know him because when I was in my former life, I was Dean of the College of Business in Tampa. And Joey was a graduate assistant and Joey was assigned to uh, work with a management science professor and he still loves the memory of trying to teach undergraduates how to do linear programming by hand. We had no calculators, we had no computers at that time, et cetera. And uh, one, I guess it was in between his first and second year that he came in, uh, we brought him into the dean's office to help advise uh, MBA students and he said, well, what do you want me to tell them? I said, make sure you make that they're coming back for their second year. That's, that's your primary job. But Joey is a very special person. I've known about his family. He was born and raised in Tampa, uh, went to Jesuit High School, then um, you know, lost his way and went up north to some school in Gainesburg and um, got his bachelor's degree in finance and uh, then still wondered what he was going to do when he grew up. And so I think he went over to Oxford for a little while and didn't like the food in England, so he came back and uh, he said, I need additional education, so 
He came into the MBA program to add real value to his degree, and since it's a USF MBA, he has proven how valuable it was. So I'm going to give you a brief, brief history of what this young man has accomplished in about 20 years. It's, uh, it's quite impressive. You know, he started as a stunt person. At five years old, he started with his grandfather was the original Joey Chitwood and started the thrill show. Then his father and his uncle joined the thrill show, so he's the third generation. So they worked up a lot of, um, I will call it events in their show. And one of the events as they traveled around the country was his dad would drive a car on two wheels around the track. And I think he still holds a record for something like six and a half hours on two, going around. Think about that. Joy had to get into the act, so he started climbing out the driver or passenger side. Now that's trust. He's standing there. I think you were outside the car. He can tell you the story about the battering ram. But anyhow, so now we have uh, Joey. And I'm going to give you a brief history, like I said. Uh, one of the things I like is that I think he's one of the first people in motorsports, in the uh, business and the motorsports, that has built a speedway from the ground up. In 1997, 99, he built uh, what is now called the Chicagoland Speedway in Joliet, Illinois. And uh, that was quite an experience because there's differences in weather, there's differences called unions, and there's differences called politics. And believe me, you have seen nothing until you've been in the state of Illinois with those three. After that, uh, he went on to become the chief operating officer of the Brickyard in Indianapolis called the 500. All right. And there, he not only ran the uh, track itself, but he also was in charge of the, what's called the Brickyard uh, Motel, hotel, and the golf course. If you haven't been to the Indianapolis 500, they have the golf course there on, on the infield. And then he came down to Tampa. He was offered a job at, I just call it Daytona International. He came down as vice president of uh, strategic planning and business development. And that was for, then I think it was 11 or 12 tracks. Yep, around the country, Phoenix, Chicagoland, et cetera. And in 2010, finally, they didn't know what to do with him, so they made him president of the Daytona International Speedway. And I think he's doing a wonderful job. You're gonna see a part of um, Joey Chitwood that most people do not see, and that is how you look into the future and build a sport that perhaps is a, not a sport, but it is entertainment. And so with that, if I may, I'd like to bring Joey up here and you're going to enjoy this. In sports, there are places you know by name, even if you're not a fan places that started from humble beginnings, but have gone on to become venues of mythic proportions. And in auto racing, there's also a name mythic enough to inspire the same kind of universal awe all over the world. It started in the imagination of a full-time auto mechanic and part-time racer named Bill France Sr. He believed that if you're going to change the world, you have to dream big. And since his dream became a reality in 1959, it's welcomed millions of racing fans from all over the globe. Along with everyone from presidents of the United States to the all-time kings of motorsports. And in the process, has come to stand for something far more important than anybody could have ever dreamed whether they're racing on four wheels, two wheels, or occasionally no wheels. Drivers and fans alike know that when they set foot in the world center of racing, 
They're truly standing on the rarest of Earth. But what's about to happen next is rare, even by Daytona standards. Welcome to the new Daytona International Speedway. It's a complete reimagining of what a sports experience can be. It will be more immersive, more interactive, and more inspiring. A true world-class home for the world center of racing. While maintaining the character of the place that's been capturing imaginations for almost 60 years. Racing is a sport that by its very nature never stands still. Cars change. Heroes rise. And fans pass along traditions from generation to generation. Evolution is as much a part of our sport as anything. And every once in a while, that evolution takes a turn that defines an era. This is one of those times. So whatever you do, hang on tight. Because we'd like to invite you to join us on the journey of a lifetime. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you Joey for taking the time. Let's just get into the video that we just saw when you talk about some of the renovations that you guys have planned with Daytona Ra Rising. Sure. It's great to be here, by the way. I really appreciate it. Thanks for showing up. And hopefully we'll have some fun tonight, share with you some big time auto racing stories and some other things. Before I, I do that, video is pretty cool, right? Yeah. You guys didn't know Tom Selleck was a race fan? So uh, it, it's funny when I play that for maybe some, uh, like uh, the undergrads today, they don't even know who Tom Selleck, Magnum P.I. is. But all I can think of is Magnum P.I. And by the way, I, when I see that video, I, I look at all the great racing that we have on our track. And so you saw some great motorcycles out there. And, and Bob, I see him over there. So I was like, you know, the craziest thing I think w is when we see motorcycles on the track going 200 miles per hour. Of course, he tells me he always thought the car guys were crazy out there, you know, going out there. I'm thinking motorcycles, there's no fenders, you know, you're going 200 miles per hour. And he's worried about the car guys out there. We are in the middle of the most ambitious project we've ever undertaken since the creation of the Speedway. You know, Big Bill France back in 1958, um, he did something really special. I think we all know what it takes to build something. It takes plans, it takes labor, it takes equipment, metal, concrete, you name it. Back then, it was determination, it was vision. More importantly, it was imagination. He imagined something bigger, faster, more exciting than anything that had been built to date. And back then, NASCAR wasn't a popular form of motorsport in our country. It was almost looked down upon. You guys remember, late 50s, it was A.J. Foyt, it was Rutherford, it was Mario, and they raced the big cars, which were the open wheel cars that raced at Indianapolis. And so here he is putting all his chips in on building this property for stock cars that wasn't even the most popular. And here we are 50 years later, the World Center of Racing, the biggest event on the calendar for racing in our country, we're investing $400 million to rebuild the Daytona International Speedway to do something no one else has ever done, to go from being a racetrack to a motorsports stadium. And so the structure that you saw, these wide concourses, these injectors, these entry gates, very stick and ball-like, it's to really take those concepts we've seen at all these other great new venues and marry them with motorsports and give our fans something that they've not had yet. And it's gonna be an experience unlike any other. The really unique challenge is we still have to run the property while we're building the property. We don't get to build it across the street or let's move Daytona to DeLand because we get a better deal on property over there. We want this place to be here in the next 50 years on the same location. And so to, to build it and run it, it's taking two and a half years. We're 15 months into the project, 60 million pounds of concrete in the ground, 40 million pounds of steel in the air to support all that structure. 40 million pounds of steel represents 1% of the annual US output of steel, okay? So that grandstand stretches nine tenths of a mile long. We have to plan for the curvature of the earth over that distance, which is seven inches. This is truly an engineering marvel. And I will tell you, as sleepless as I am about it, as challenged as we are about budget and what we wanna do, I wouldn't wanna be any other place than in the middle of something historic, unique, more importantly special, and you think about what the France family has done for racing in our country. And here I am in the middle of something that gets to perpetuate that legacy of the Daytona International Speedway. 
And, and look, I'm proud of what they do, and it's amazing when you think about what this sports property has done. 60% of our race day crowd comes from outside the state of Florida. On average, they spend five nights while they're here. The economic impact from that is substantial. We don't have to bid for it. You know, it doesn't move to Phoenix. It doesn't move to New Orleans or any other. But it's here in our state, and it drives so much of that economic impact, and we're really proud of. And, and for us, I think this investment, what's next? Music festivals, uh, football, soccer, you, you name it. This really gives us a chance to compete for other unique sporting events that currently right now, with a 50-year-old property, we're not there yet. But January of 16, we'll be ready. I guess I should give it back to you, maybe ask a question. I'm sorry, I kind of took over here a little it's bit. But I get excited. Right. I, I get, you know, again, $400 million, the biggest investment in our company's history. Um, you, know, there's, you know, being in the sports world, you always want to be involved in things that are special. And be careful what you ask for, because you might get it. And so I got it. And, and, but I'm excited, because I, I'll tell you, for the fans of our sport, for the new fans coming up, this is going to be a game changer. This will truly make the experience um, like no other racetrack in the world. Well, piggybacking off of what you just said, you're talking about the project. Part of it is going to be the, the backstretch grandstands are going to be coming down. What are you going to do for the people that already have tickets for the race? So we have 146,000 seats, 101,000 on the front stretch, 45 on the back stretch. At the end of 2015, we're going to take down the back stretch grandstand. We're actually going to ship that to some of our other racetracks. Uh, what we find is that's that's a, a seat that there does not renew well. Maybe we renew 10% of those seats. And we also find that customer doesn't convert to the front stretch. In other words, we just churn. They sample and then they go away. Also for us, you know, I'm building all these great things on the front stretch. 40 escalators, wider seats, concourses, 11 football field sized neighborhoods for fans to be socially connected. I can't really sell a subpar experience on the back when it compares to that. So we've actually started relocating a number of those customers to the front stretch to make sure we get them in the right seats. But moving forward, we'll only have the seats on the front. And for us, when you think about it, you get pit lane, victory lane, the driver intros. The back stretch has always been a little bit of a tougher sell because you're kind of disconnected. I think even more so now with all these new amenities on the front stretch. So for us, it, it was that was really a, a business decision when you look at the numbers. It was almost decided by the chart that showed me the renewal rates and what happens with those customers in the first place. Because for us, it's a lot easier to renew a ticket than to sell a new one. It costs you a lot of money to find a new customer. And when you see a grandstand that you're churning and you have to replace that customer year over year, that's not the good business decision. Let's get everybody on the front stretch and really worry about the renewal and retention rate more so than the new customer. And the Daytona 500? Uh, finished on a Monday night a couple years ago. What kind of success did you guys see from that? It, I'm assuming we have some folks who've been to the Daytona 500. Yeah? Any of you with us when we rained it out for the first time in our history and had to run on a Monday? Okay, and on top of that, it rained on Monday. And so we had to run in prime time. The first time ever we had a rain out, yet we had to run on Monday night. So I can't tell you the emotion I felt when we finally went green at 7, 7.30 on a Monday night. So much tension about a rain out and getting your fans to come back, really staffing the venue the next day. It's about getting uh, employees for the buses, guest services, security. Uh, we did an all hands on deck. Everybody in the corporate building had to work that day. And so, great, green flag, Whew, we did it. We're there, we're racing. Lap 130, Juan Montoya, for some reason, loses control of his car, spins up and hits the jet dryer. And we have an explosion in turn three of the racetrack. I was actually in race control at the time. And I'll never forget the shock first. And they were dealing with another caution. There was some other incident on the racetrack. So the jet dryers were out there blowing the debris off the racetrack. And Mike Hilton, president of NASCAR, caught it. And he and I both start yelling at one of the fire rescue individuals in race control to send the equipment to turn three. And he doesn't really know why we're yelling this because we're seeing on video the jet dryer after the explosion is leaking fuel down the track. Well, Mike and I, we both know it's going to catch fire. I mean, we don't wait for the fire. Go now. So the worst thing that happens with asphalt is when you have gasoline on it. You, if you allow it to stay there, it'll break up the, the asphalt. In a couple hours, you could actually reach your hand in and pull it up. Well, what do you think happens when you set asphalt on fire, right? So immediately it's like, oh my gosh, I don't know if we're going to finish the event. And so then the social world went crazy. 
whether it was Twitter, Facebook, you, people were going, oh my God, Daytona, the track's on fire. They blew up a jet dryer. And so it took us a couple hours and, and we didn't know if we could finish that race. Anybody know who was leading at that time at lap 130? It's Dave Blaney, okay? Not sure many people know who he is. Well, they would, they would have known if he had been a Daytona 500 champion at that point. Luckily, we got the track repaired. We went back to racing, finished at about midnight finally, and uh, Matt Kenseth won the race. But talk about an emotional roller coaster of delaying the race, postponing the race, delaying it again till Monday night. We're in prime time. Yay, we're green. And then we blow up a jet dryer. So uh, I like to think that I'm really well-versed in crisis management at this point. Uh, I would like some better weather, though. The next couple events, we seem to be snake bit. Uh, we've had some weather this past year, both the 500 and the 400. But look, Dale Jr. won the race after the rain delay. I'm not going to complain about that. When Dale Jr. wins, it's usually good for the sport. Uh, and uh, he was so, um, I don't know if you saw the messaging. He was, he was very mature about his win, and it really put it in perspective because he had so much success early on. And so to see him now achieve it later in his career, you know, that, that drought of wins it puts it in perspective about how difficult this sport is. And it was great to kind of see him really understand what it takes to win a race when I think he thought it was easy back in the day. And to see him really come of age and, and some great messaging. I'm not sure I could have scripted him even better, but uh, needless to say, for 2016, when we open up the new property, we have to have good weather. If we don't, though, we've got great weather protection in the new venue, wide concourses, people will be dry. So we've got a good plan for that if we ever have bad weather again. Well, I was going to say, I mean, is there any discussion about trying to play with the dates at all to kind of avoid that bad weather? You know, we've done that once where we moved the date to accommodate the NASCAR schedule. I don't really want to ever do that again. Uh, you know, I find I learn more about timeshare condos and week eight versus week nine in the Daytona Beach market than I ever want to deal with again. And it just shows you, though, how far reaching our fan base is. I talked to a number of folks from Alberta, Canada who are very passionate about the weekend that they rent their timeshare. And so I really don't want to uh, deliver that news to our customers. We actually let them know over a year in advance in terms of pushing back a weekend. And that still wasn't enough time. I had a, a fan call me. Um, it, it was a woman, she's very upset. Her husband in his job has to put his uh, vacation schedule in a year in advance. So in February, they had already put their vacation in for the next year. And, she was uh, not pleased with me about the date change and really wasn't going to be happy with anything. So what I did is I said, okay, here's the best I could do. I'm going to give you my cell phone number. If you would give it to your husband to give to his boss, I will be happy to talk to his boss to see if we can work out something to change his vacation schedule. Um, she never did, but I will tell you, I got a very interesting response with, she's like, are you serious? I said, I'm going to give you the number right now. And I gave it to her. And part of our job is to make sure that our fans enjoy the experience with us. And you can never go far enough for the customer. doesn't mean I can say yes all the time when they want garage passes or they want to meet Dale Jr., but the commitment that we'll take it as far as we can. And if I can talk to your husband's boss and work out something, I'll be happy to do that to get you to come back and be a customer. Well, Prior to running Daytona, you were running Indianapolis. So what's it like to run two of the most successful tracks in, in the sport? Stressful. All right. So I come from a family business. And so my grandfather, my dad, my uncle, myself, and I understand the uniqueness of family businesses. It's not a nine to five job. It's 24 seven, it's personal. There's emotion involved. It's really difficult to separate those two. So I go to Indianapolis. It's a privately run family business. I understand what that's like. I come down to Daytona, and even though it's a public company, the France family has a controlling interest. And again, different, different parts. You know, Brian France runs NASCAR. Lisa, my boss, runs Daytona or runs ISC. And so for me, I get it. I understand what that's like. I will say this. Uh, when I was at USF, and I remember this one day, um, thinking about what was next for me. You know, I, I was really challenged because I, I didn't prepare myself. So, you know, Dean made fun of it, but, but candidly, I was the third generation of a family business. I'd worked for them forever. I never thought I would do anything else. I just assumed I was going to be a stuntman. I questioned whether or not I needed to go to college. I just, hey, I'm a chitwood. This is what I do. And so I never really applied myself. I didn't really take advantage of the opportunities. And so if you're going to go someplace and not apply yourself, I would recommend Gainesville. Okay. <laughs> All right. 
from what I remember, there were some football games, there were some parties. When I left the family after that and went to the U.S., that's when I really had the reality check. That's when I realized this is serious. And I was in an environment there that really helped me understand what was important, provided me some leadership opportunities, but more than anything, the support to kind of take the shot. And I remember having this conversation, and I think the dean was part of it, maybe Dr. Baumgarten too, that was, what do you guys think? You know, what am I really prepared for? And it's like, Joey, you have a finance degree. You've been in motorsports for 20 years. You've got these companies that are going public. You know, racing is turning into a real business, a corporation. You're the only guy out there with that experience. I think the next week I sent out two resumes, one to Tony George and one to Bill France. But it was great to have someone else put it in perspective for me because I was so close to it. And I'll never forget that. I mean, tr for me, that experience at USF and the Tampa campus, it was really like, okay, we're going to give you some confidence. You've got a skill set. We're going to kind of fine tune it. We're going to give you some opportunities to, to do better in terms of leading teams and, and participating in internships. And I was the president of the Graduate Business Association, so I was on a policy committee with the dean. Again, a chance to understand what leadership is like and working in a team environment. And, uh, and for the price of some stamps back then, uh, we took a shot at it, and by the way, I got a rejection letter from Bill France and NASCAR, all right? Kind of ironic that uh, now I'm actually involved in their biggest project ever. So uh, in our world, no is temporary, okay? Never take no for a final answer. There's always a way to get a yes in there someplace. Well, let's take it all the way back. You were mentioning your family business, uh, the Joey Chitwood Thrill Show. What was it like growing up in that environment? Y you know, people, are, uh, how many people have seen the show? Um, it, you know, up in the Northeast, growing up there, a lot of stuff in Pennsylvania, New York. We did some stuff here in Florida as well. I didn't know any different. I, I, didn't, I didn't understand that this was kind of cool or unique. Or I just know that come Memorial Day, I get out of school, I'd go on the road with the family, and this is what I did. And I'd fly home at Labor Day a couple of weeks late for school, maybe fly up once or twice on some of the bigger shows, and I just assumed that's, that's what I was supposed to do. And so age five, I was actually uh, driving a go-kart. At age eight, I drove a miniature Indy. And at 12, I drove a Chevette for the first time. So I was driving a, a car in the show. But I will tell you, it's a lot less glamorous than you realize. I had a truck driver's license. I drove one of the car carriers. We would average four or five performances a week. So a typical schedule would be we'd be in Dunkirk, New York perform the show at 8 o'clock at night at 9.30. We'd be done, get cleaned up, go meet the promoter, settle up, get on the road. And, and this is great. You guys will appreciate this. We had a, a fleet of about seven vehicles that we had to get over the road, some car carriers, some semis. I would give our crew a 3 by 5 note card, and it would be the route slip to get to the next place. And you had to stay on this route. We didn't have GPS or email or cell phone. And so I would be the last one in the caravan. I had the money and the mechanic. And if you broke down and you were on this route, I'd get you. If you weren't, I wouldn't know about it until the next day. You'd actually have to call the fair and tell them that you were broken down or you were missing. And so we had to do that for five months of the year. Okay, it was a very stressful environment. But I will tell you, it helped me understand what hard work means. Okay, what it takes to get things done. At that point, again, no is temporary. You have to figure out how you get to the next place. So we drive a couple hours at night, pull over in a truck stop or rest area, wake up the next day, drive a couple more hours, get to Honesdale, Pennsylvania at 11 or noon, unload the equipment, clean it up, go meet the Chevy dealer, talk to the fair. Usually we would have to get in heavy equipment and get their track in condition because some of the smaller fairs wouldn't even work on their facility during the, so we get the water truck out, we get a grader to get it ready to perform the show, perform the show, and do the same thing over again. But I didn't know any different. That's what I was supposed to do. Uh, it was a challenge uh, leaving the stunt show after that, after 20 years of doing that, but I will tell you, it, it really prepared me. So Dean made fun of the aerial wing walk, but I was 14 years old. I was in Harrington, Delaware, and a TV show showed up called That's Incredible. You guys remember the TV show that? So I was gonna be an incredible kid. And so I did some of the unique stunts that day and my dad would drive a car on two wheels. I would climb out of the passenger window and stand on the side of the car and balance, almost like surfing on the side of a car. But uh, more so than that, I did another stunt called the human battering ram. I'd put on a fire suit and a helmet, I'd lay on the hood of a car and they would drive me through a burning board wall and I would burst through with my helmet. I can't think of anything that has prepared me as well for a career in motorsports <laughs> than the human battering ram. 
unfortunately, I don't get to wear a helmet now. Back then, at least I had a helmet. I feel like every day I've got to just kind of run through the wall with my head and, you know, break through with that idea or, or get something going. But, but again, you know, having come from that experience, uh, you know, I just feel comfortable understanding what it takes. And sometimes it's hard. And sometimes you got to go a little bit farther, a little bit faster. You got to push a little bit to get done what you need to get done to be successful. And I really credit my uh, grandfather, my dad. There was, I'll tell you another funny story. I'll make fun of myself. Hopefully you guys enjoy that. And I, I do. It's, you know, embarrassment. Who cares? I was practicing the aerial wing walk. So we had the car up on blocks. It, it wasn't moving. And I would climb in and out and I would stand there. My grandfather would rock the car back and forth. I'd climb in, I'd climb out, and they were filming it for some B-roll as part of the TV show. And I get up there one time, and I'm balancing, and he pushes it over on all four wheels while I'm up on the side of the car. So I get thrown off the car. I roll around in the dirt, and I'm 14, and so I'm a little bit like, hey, what, Chief, what's that about? My grandfather always called him the Chief. I said, what's that about? He goes, you got to learn that too. So early on, I learned what it was like to fail, and that's as important as learning what it's like to succeed and, uh, and so we learned some hard lessons early on, but I think it served me well for trying to run these historic properties. The one thing I will say about these properties that I appreciate, it generates a response. Our fans care. They care about what we do and how we do it. And I want that more than fans being apathetic and not really caring if we, we make the right investments or not. So we have to be prepared, though, to respond to our fans when they have questions about what we're doing and why we're doing it and know that our properties are so special to them that they're gonna have a response one way or the other. Well, what led to the uh, decision to leave the uh, stunt show after so many years? You know, it, it's interesting. I don't know, many of you have been in family businesses, but there's a point where, uh, you know, whether it would be the arrogance of youth on my part, I wanted to do things in a certain way. Uh, if the show was ultimately gonna be something that I continued to participate in, I'd been doing it for 20 years, I felt like we needed to go in this direction. My uncle and my dad felt strongly that they needed to be in another direction, and we just couldn't get in the right place about it. And so for me, though, after 20 years in the business, and probably the realization, I'd come home to Tampa after five months on the road, and it didn't even feel like my hometown. It just felt odd. I just didn't feel like I even had a home, and I thought, am I going to do this for 20 more years? I don't even know what a personal life would be like. You ever do start a family? It just, it just... I couldn't see it anymore. So once we kind of had some stumbling blocks about the business, I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to do something else. And of course, didn't have a plan. You know, luckily, USF was my plan and, and it worked out. The stunt show, unfortunately, ended five years after I left. So it ended in 1998, which was part of, of what we were challenged with, which was sponsorship, uh, revenue, you know, fares and speedways, just not the same. You know, they're not the same kind of entertainment that we have in this country versus Daytona International Speedway or Walt Disney World. So I think it was probably some realization on both our parts, my dad, myself, my uncle, how tough the business was getting and what the future was going to be like and, and my thoughts on what we had to do and where they were. So it, it was a tough uh, six to eight months after I left. Um, but I will tell you this, uh, you guys, you, I'm okay telling stories. You like my stories? Are they okay so far? I'll tell you another funny story. This time I'll make fun of my dad. So. It's very difficult leaving a family business. And of course, I had some energy to really show them that I could do something on my own. And so I leave, I go to Walt Disney World Speedway, I work there, I get the chance to go to Indianapolis. But then I get this real opportunity to build Chicagoland Speedway. And I'm a young man at this point, you know, I'm 30 years old, and this is a huge responsibility, a $135 million project. I'm working for both the Holman George family from Indy and the France family from Daytona. It was a partnership. So it took us 22 months to build this venue. And so it's there, it's opening day, we are killing it. We had a great traffic plan, we get everyone parked, great pre-race, the race is there. My dad is in the suite. So I've got him up there meeting everybody and Tony George, okay, one of my bosses, tells my dad how great a job I'm doing. Bill French Jr. comes over and tells my dad how great a job I'm doing. So he is feeling, it. he's having a good time, might be having a cocktail or two, enjoying this experience that his son's doing a good job. And, He's there with his, uh, his second wife, and my wife's there, and so he's feeling proud because we're doing a great job, and he kind of you know, has a cocktail and says, happiest day of my life. So that meant a lot you know, for, for me to branch out, and he was so proud of me. Of course, his second wife says, prouder than when you married me? <laughs> and he said, yes. So I think he's still praying the price, but I do appreciate how proud of me he was at that moment. 
you know, when you think about namesakes and I'm Joey the third and I think he thought I would always carry on the tradition too. And so that's some tough personal stuff that you deal with. But in that moment, years later, it was nice to put it in perspective that uh, I was able to take the, the legacy of the name and do something a little different with it, but something just as proud as what my grandfather did with the stunt show. So um, my grandfather, he was a great man. He was tough, but I think all the things I learned from him have helped me so much with what I'm doing now. Um, the one thing that is a disappointment for me is he raced at Indianapolis, finished fifth three times, uh, was the only, first man to ever wear a seatbelt there. And uh, he wasn't around uh, when I ran that track. He, he passed away in 88. And so for me, that would have been the, the, the crown and grace for him to be around when I ran that property of which he raced in it. So that was always one of those moments of, ooh, this would have been perfect. But I think he was looking down saying, uh, saying I was doing a good job. What were some of the biggest things that you learned from your grandfather that you apply now? You know, for uh, I would tell you, it was such a tough business back in the day. And for him to be a barnstormer and to take this stunt show and turn it into something unique, something that people remember, he had five units touring the United States. And he would fly to different units. And, and really right even now for people to say, if you see somebody do something crazy in a car and you spin out or you save it, oh, man, you pulled a Joey Chitwood. So just kind of that recognition of what he used to do and the fact that so many people remember it, it was tough business back then. And to be a barnstormer and to travel around, I mean, a traveling stunt show in the 50s, I mean, imagine what it took to get equipment around and, and personnel and to do the job then. And I know how challenging it was for us in the 80s and 90s. And to do it back then, I can't imagine. But to be a race car driver, to be a stunt man, um, really to, to kind of be a, um, also to create kind of the stunt atmosphere in movies. Uh, he was known for being um, the stunt double for Clark Gable in a movie called To Please a Lady. And it was a movie about Clark Gable being a race car driver. And uh, he was a dirty race car driver. He spun someone out to win a race. So they suspend him and kick him out of racing. So he decides to be a lowly stunt man in the Joey Chitwood Thrill Show to kind of earn his penance to be back as a race car driver. So the movie is all about that. And my grandfather was a stunt double. But, you know, just to, to see what he was able to accomplish back then and, and for the family to kind of carry through, um, you know, I'm very proud about that. And, and probably disappointed I have a son. I have a 13-year-old son, J4. So he's number four. And um, we had a chance a couple years ago to be part of an induction ceremony for the Motorsports Hall of Fame. My grandfather was inducted a couple years ago, so my dad, myself, and my son, we went, we went up for it, and I got to represent the family and speak on behalf, and it was nice for my son to realize what his great-grandfather did, because he would never really get that chance by looking at pictures, and so we went up there, and during the cocktail reception, it was open to the public, and so I brought a bunch of Chitwood books. We did a great book on my grandfather, his life and time, some great photos, and so we were signing autographs and, and giving the book to the fans that wanted it, and so my son was being asked for his autograph, okay? And so at that time, he was probably nine years old, eight or nine years old, and he thought that was the coolest thing in the world. I, I'm signing a book, and he said, he's like, Dad, we need to do this when we go back to Tampa. I'm like, do what? He goes, give autographs out. You know, listen, you're giving an autograph because you're gra your great-grandfather. you got to understand the person. But again, his realization that, that his great-grandfather did something special that people remember to this day, and we get to kind of enjoy that legacy. So that was a really nice element for me because I'm not sure he would have ever been exposed to it. Um, you know, racing's a different business nowadays. You know, for, for him, you know, I hope that maybe the only thing he drives is a golf ball long and straight. You know, for me to be in the business and to spend my career doing it, it would be difficult to be one of those fathers watching his son race. Now, if he wanted to do it, we'd go after it big and bold like anything else that the Chitwoods do. But it's nice that he's got some other interests right now because my plate's a little bit full as we're trying to build this property. Well, how much pressure is there, you know, carrying on the name and being part of such a historic type of family? Oh, I mean, without a doubt, if there's one thing that, that I'm very careful about, it, it's it's the legacy that my grandfather created. I mean, he did something special, and shame on to me if I were to ever do something stupid to tarnish that name. I mean, that's very serious. And no matter what role I have, and, and I appreciate working for the Holman George family in Indy and the France family in Daytona, and I want to represent them, and I want them to be proud of, of me representing these legacy properties. But for me, you know, if I were to do anything to tarnish our family name, then then just I deserve to be smacked pretty good because he did something very special and, and I just get to enjoy that opportunity to carry it on. I, I'm 
I'm so happy that I got to kind of branch off a little bit and add my own spin to it. Uh, but at the end of the day, no matter what racetrack I run, whatever job I'm going to have in the future, I'm just a guy who grew up as a stuntman. That's who I am. That's never going to change. It's about hustle. It's about promotion. You know, at the end of the day, we were, you know, we were, we were carnival showmen. That's who we were. And, and I learned a lot back then. I think a lot of things I learned back then helped me today. I mean, I get it. I get what it takes for us to earn a living, to work hard, to generate revenue, to get things done. And um, I, I, that puts me in a good spot. So I think the families, both the ones in Indy and, and Daytona, appreciate that I came to them with experiences that were relevant and that I'm going to keep working hard and doing all the right things for them. And, and it's right place, right time. Sometimes, you know, you just got to be ready for that opportunity. And I, I have been along the way. And um, I remember going to Daytona when I was a young person with my dad. He's owned tickets there for over 26 years. And so um, this is good. I'll tell you another funny story. So I, my grandfather was a race car driver, raced at Indy. I got to ran, run Indy. I'm going to tell you maybe even a little bit better story. So I was born February 20th, 1969. I'm 45 years old. And my mom gave birth to me in Tampa, Florida, uh, in St. Joe's Hospital. I think it's on Martin Luther King Drive or Buffalo Drive. She was on her own. My dad was not there that day. He was actually too busy. He was racing a car at Daytona International Speedway. They announced over the PA that he was a father at that point. So then he had to drive back to Tampa. So Indy with my grandfather. Daytona with my dad might have been in my blood. So this might have been a, a course I didn't know about back then. So maybe Stuntman was just kind of a temporary thing as I had to get to these historic properties that my family had participated at. Well, obviously racing is in your blood, but it wasn't always a guarantee that that's where you were going to head. You came to USF to get your MBA. Just talk about your decision to kind of get back into it. You know, it's interesting. I actually had a conversation. I don't know if Dean Anderson knows this. I really enjoyed my experience at USF uh, and being in that situation, the chance to, as you can tell, I'm kind of a confident person. I like having a microphone in my hand. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, teaching the, the undergrads. I, I, that was something that I hadn't done that before, but I really, I really like that. I actually considered whether or not I wanted to get a PhD and go down uh, that route. Um, luckily, they talked some sense into me and got me headed back down the motorsports path. Uh, I do think that the experiences I've had in motorsports would prepare me well for other sports. Uh, motorsports is really unique because of you know the driver, the team, TV, the racetracks. There's a lot of competition. The marketing rights are, are very um, challenging in terms of who owns what. And so there's a little bit of a, 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 you're well prepared for whatever's next. And so I, I don't know what's next for me. Um, I will tell you, it's challenging. We were talking about setting goals, you know, and, and I said at one point back then, I want to run a super speedway, and I've had that chance. And so for me, maybe maybe it's bringing the stunt show back at some point. Maybe that's what my calling is to, to go back to it. But, y you know, I, I'm going to enjoy what I'm doing now. But I think there's also an element that you always have to be prepared that there's going to be something else. And I think that's really important. As cool a job as I have, um, and by the way, there's days when it's not that cool, right? Blowing up jet dryers wasn't a cool day. Raining out the Daytona 500 for the first time in our history wasn't a cool day. But you have to appreciate that, live in that moment, enjoy it. I tell my team this, you know, we are, we have taken on a big task. Running Daytona it is not easy. We operate the venue 250 days a year. But building at the, at the same time, it's almost like we've asked everybody kind of to take on two jobs right now. And so I tell them, you know what, as challenging as it is, Think about the Glory Days song by Bruce Springsteen, right? You know, about thinking about how great it was. Don't wait 10 years to say, man, we were doing something special. Let's live in that moment now. Enjoy what you're doing now. And I know it's going to be tough some days, but you know how many people would jump at the chance to reimagine this American icon, to be the ones rebuilding Daytona? There'd be a long list of people who jump at that chance. So let's enjoy that now, now while we're in the moment versus waiting 10 years over a beer or two and say, hey, remember when we did that? That was pretty cool. And tell the stories then. Let's tell those stories now. So after that, we'll see. I, I laughed. Somebody asked me, what was I going to do after I get the track built? And I said, well, instead of a vacation, I think I need a sabbatical at that point. Uh, I think mentally it'll be a, a little bit challenging to get geared up for something else. Doesn't seem like that would be in your DNA, though, to kind of slow down. You know, my wife did this to me uh, a couple weeks ago. We're into 
personal goals and planning and we have a son and trying to figure out college for him and you know you got to get you got to start dealing with retirement funds you, again all those typical things in life that you have to do and so you start saying okay at what year would you want to retire and and do you have a plan that gets you there and so we start talking about well if i'm this old maybe this or this and she goes really seriously that's like two days after two days you're going to want to go back to work and i laughed and i said you know you're right I enjoy working. Uh, I, I feel good. I like to be there early. I like to stay late. Um, I'm excited about things like that. So I give her credit that she called me out and she nailed me pretty good that retirement probably isn't going to be something on my list anytime soon. And hopefully I get to continue in sports. I continue in motorsports. I, I told Dean, I said, you know, maybe at some point if I ever do slow down, I could get back to uh, one of the campuses and talk to some kids about sports marketing and, and things like that. I might have a story or two that they might enjoy so who knows uh but I, i'll tell you this no matter what i'm going to do i'm going to go after it 110 percent. i think maybe that's part of the racing thing you know um first place is what wins the prize you don't really get anything for second place anybody want to finish second no i don't want to finish second i want to finish first so it's about keeping your foot on the gas and going fast and making sure you're in first place so what's the craziest story you have from the uh, stunt show the craziest story from the stunt show. Okay, so to put this in perspective, we're a traveling stunt show. We operate five months a year. It's not like we were attracting road scholars to be traveling stuntmen with us. And so I'm 16 years old. I'm 17 years old. I'm managing individuals who are twice my age and just have ideas about fame and glory that they want to achieve. So I saw a lot of different things growing up, you know, just a different side of the business and the challenges uh, of that and, and dealing with hard people. Uh, and so for me, um, those were some tough, tough days to really learn. And uh, I give my dad and my grandfather credit. I mean, they just kind of threw me into it. And so I probably have some stories that probably aren't for video cameras and maybe we, you know, do it over a cocktail now and again. But again, for me in the moment, I didn't know anything different, but now looking back, I say, Oh my gosh, I was 17 and I was dealing with that. I mean, I'm not sure I had the capacity to understand that other than just getting the show done. And, um, and, and I know this, if I had the stunt show today and I were to have my son in another year as a 14 year old perform some of the things I did, I would be arrested for child endangerment. There's no way I could get away with that in the year 2014 or 2015. Can you imagine? I mean, I was 14 years old. I was standing on the side of a car as my dad drove it on two wheels. We were going 40 miles per hour. I, I can't imagine that child services didn't step in at some point and say, what are you doing? But there's just no way we could ever do that. It was 100% safe though, right? Oh, 100% safe. And the fact that we would do it hundreds of times a year was, was the other element. So uh, I, I, do, uh, I do think about the opportunity to maybe write those stories down you know, the good ones and the bad ones. And uh, actually, I'd have a title for my book already. Yeah. I think it'd be, um, it was safer being a stuntman, you know, <laughs> big time tales from, from auto racing. Uh, I do laugh about it. Um, you know, even though I'm on the management side, there was something about being in control, you know, being a stuntman and you were responsible for your own success. It was your job to hit your marks, to drive the car on two wheels, to perform. Uh, I think that the challenge, and I'm sure you guys have all been in business, is managing people, you know, setting expectations, goals, and, and managing them. And there are days when I think, you know, it'd be nice if I was just the guy in charge and I could just do that myself. And so maybe it was safer uh, risking my life as a stuntman than doing what I'm doing today. Well, let's fast forward. Daytona 500 is the marquee event at, at the Speedway. But you guys also have the Coke 0400, and that got moved to the 4th of July weekend. Uh, just kind of talking about the uh you know the is there a worry about attendance being on a holiday weekend so uh, for 29 years we've been on the saturday of july 4th weekend and so nbc is coming back into the fold after a 10-year hiatus and they are truly committed to taking our sport to the next level and you know espn's done a nice job but nbc is really now starting to show how they're going to own it and what they're going to do differently moving forward and nbc did something in the sports world that's pretty amazing when you think about it you know, before they showed up, Sunday night football was on ESPN. It wasn't really well viewed. They took Sunday night football and have turned it into the number one show on TV. You know, football night in America. Their commitment to us is they want to do something special with our Coke Zero event on that Sunday night, July 5th. They want to take some of that football magic and sprinkle it over that event. 
And, and you know, Canada, that was a tough one for us because of being on a Saturday and fans. But when you see their commitment and see what they've done and see their history with Sunday night, uh, football night in America, you realize, you know what? We're going to work with you because they're going to try and promote this sport and take it to the next level. Uh, we'll get back to our traditional date after that, which is a Saturday. But, uh, you know, you've got to you got to understand and be willing to work with your partners like that. And we've seen a great commitment with them so far. So hopefully we'll, we'll see a great result uh, when they run the first event. So we'll be the first event on NBC. So that's kind of this. So we'll transition from Fox, the first half. The Coke Zero is the first NBC event. So that's why they want to take it to a, to a new level with that Sunday night. So we're going to open it up for a little questions from uh, the audience. Anybody uh, have any questions for Joey? They'll bring a mic down here. We'll get you on mic so everybody can hear it. Joey, I'd like to introduce you to one of your family members. Say hello to Jerry Lee Chitwood <laughs> from Indianapolis. Um, Jerry's been here operating his own enterprises. And it's nice to hear you talk so much about your family and, and joy for it. Uh, I first remember when uh, the movie Diamonds Are Forever, James Bond, and saw the Chitwood. And I met Jerry 28 years ago, and he represents the name and family very well. So uh, you guys fans of James Bond movies? So Diamonds Are Forever was one of the, the movies we're in, but another one even more so, Live and Let Die. So in that movie, literally everything was my grandfather, my dad, and the stuntmen who worked for us. It starts out in the beginning of the movie, James Bond is in a taxi in New York City, and the taxi driver gets hit in the head with a dart and they go crashing. My dad's actually the one who gets hit in the head with the dart. He's actually driving the taxi. He actually ripped the top off of a double-decker bus, actually drove an airplane, ripped the wings off of it, but literally in that movie, Live and Let Die, um, everything's us. You guys remember the TV show Miami Vice? Yeah. Right? This is how fate kind of works. My dad was the actual stunt director for the pilot of Miami Vice, right? And so he did all the stunts in it. They offered him that job full time, but it was a pilot. So we didn't know if it was gonna take off or not. And so he had all the commitments to the stunt show. And so he actually turned it down and recommended a friend of ours to be the stunt coordinator. That individual is now retired, living quite well on all of the residuals from Miami Vice. But it's kind of funny how it all works in terms of um, opportunities in the film business, but uh, a lot of James Bond stuff. How about uh, Chips? Remember the TV show Chips uh, about the California Highway Patrol? Uh, our stunt show was actually featured one time in one of their episodes. So uh, whether it was on the track at uh, County Fair Speedway or sometimes uh, the movie lots of Hollywood, uh, we were able to have some fun along the way. Anybody else with a question for Joey? thought to doing a road race at Daytona instead of the round ground stuff so uh, have you been to our so you mean on the road course we have now well have you been to our Rolex 24 event no. so uh, we've been having an event for over 50 years called the Rolex 24 and it's a sports car race and so it starts give or take at 2 o'clock on Saturday and we finish at 2 o'clock on Sunday and it's a 3.6 mile road course race. It uses some of the high banks but uses the road course on the inside. Also the motorcycles you saw out there, they run on that road course as well. So the first three months of the year, uh, you know, I don't think we have any days off. We literally go testing sports cars, stock cars, and motorcycles. And for those of you who've been to the Rolex 24, wow, the infield from about 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. on Saturday night. I think it's the Daytona version of Mardi Gras. I mean, from a people watching perspective, it's, it's fabulous. It's a great event. That infield is rocking. And so from a road course perspective, those are some of the events that we run. And it's definitely a different feel than the, than the oval um, because that infield, you can get so close to it. And then when you're in the infield, it's just overwhelming from the sound and everything like that. So that's usually at the end of January. So I'd put that on your list. And if you do attend, Saturday night is when you want to be there. That's when things get pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Who else has a question for Mr. Chitwood here? Anybody? Joey, thanks for being here. Um, I remember when I was out to see you out, out in Daytona, uh, you took us off track to a museum, uh, memorabilia and, and everything. I was just wondering how, and the, the gentlemen that were there were absolutely amazing. I'm just wondering how it's, uh, 
it, how it's going right now with it and if you have any other plans for it um, in the future. Uh, that's a great question. We actually have two things going on. We have an archives department, which we have this great collection of our history. I actually pulled the file of my dad from all of our driver files to see what he filled out way back in the day. A great collection of trophies and cars and footage. And so we've got this tour that we offer where fans can take a tour of the racetrack, but then go to the archives department to see the history. But um, this past year, I've been able to secure, secure some additional content. We're actually gonna move the Motorsports Hall of Fame of America from Detroit, Michigan, down to Daytona Beach, Florida. So that's actually also gonna be a part of the tour that you might take of the Daytona International Speedway. Our tour takes you out on property. We take you out on the high banks and up in race control in the tower. You then come back to the building and get to see the winning car. So Dale Jr., his winning car, we take it right from Victory Lane and we put it on display inside our building. So after you get to see the winning car, you would then tour the Motorsports Hall of Fame of America as you exit. We hope to get them up and running sometime in 2016. They're starting to kind of get their plans together and make the move. So that's some additional content that, that we're going to add. But it's such a rich history. There's so many unique things. The footage of racing on the beaches, to me, is just so impressive. And the fact that we've got a lot of that, uh, that, that's really tells the story so well. I mean, I could get up here and tell you the history of Daytona. I can't do it better than the images that we showed you at the beginning of this. I mean, it just shows you how unique it was, how cool it was. And, you know, racing on the beaches wasn't about race cars racing each other. It was about speed. Uh, you know, really back then in the early 1900s, there was no asphalt roads. There weren't any places to go fast. They would use the beach to actually test automobiles and to go fast. Well, 1938, uh, a car called the Bluebird went 275 miles per hour on the beach. We actually own that car. We have that um, inside one of our spaces. And so 1938, 275 miles per hour. One run down the beach of five miles would ruin the set of tires. That's how fast you basically, you were running so fast you were ruining the tires. And so that got so unsafe because of soft sand or high tide and they moved everything out to the salt flats that they started racing on the beaches. What's even more unique, I know you'd like this, Bob, so they had a motorcycle race and a car race the first time. Nobody really liked the, the car race. The motorcycle race was pretty interesting. So people said, well, let's bring the motorcycle race back, not show about the cars. Well, we'll do that anyway since we're gonna do racing. And then the cars took on. But racing on the beach, the first thing that was really popular was the motorcycle race. And that got racing with cars back in the fold. So just kind of a little tidbit there that's kind of interesting in terms of Daytona and the beach. Got another question over here. One more. He's given us the signal. So this one or get to one more after this one? Okay. One more two, two questions. This one and one more. Zoe, appreciate your time coming down. Um, I, I guess my question is I've noticed over there I've been a NASCAR fan for – forever probably but uh, and I race too but um, I've noticed that the attendance at the at the events has dwindled over the years and what do you attribute that to is the ticket prices was it the economy and um, you know what do you plan on doing about one thing that I think is a good move that you mentioned was another network picking up what the cable uh, that's one thing that I don't like sometimes when I'm traveling or on a boat or something you can't watch the race if it's not on a network because it's on cable or a satellite TNT ESPN uh, the the other part of the question is I was at Daytona I think for the first time in 1990 when you when they filmed Days of Thunder mm -hmm. and uh, uh, has there been any thought of ever doing another movie that's not tacky like Talladega Nights was I thought uh, Talladega Nights was pretty good I was <laughs> well, like <laughs> You know. But no, it wasn't the same as Days of Thunder. Days of Thunder, I thought, was very well done. And uh, uh, I was a little disappointed. I was standing at the finish line uh, at the Flagman. When they, but when they, when they played the movie, there was no one standing at the, at the finish line. So like a retake. So <laughs> the year after Talladega Nights, they actually had a merchandise truck that went out just like the other driver merchandise trailers. And it was the Wonder Bread. It was the fourth best-selling merchandise that year. It went like Dale Jr., Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart, and then the Ricky Bobby stuff. I mean, that's how popular it ended up being. A great question, and, and I'm going to give if you. If you would do something, just have Montoya hit another jet dryer because that was that unbelievable. Or, do, you, do you remember the classic one, Stroker Ace, with uh, Burt Reynolds way back in the day? That was a pretty bad one too. Actually, there's been some interesting ones. Um, it's a great question, and I'm going to give you an example that actually it kind of dawned on me some of our challenges. So I moved back here to Florida about five years ago. So right, get a new home, figure everything out. I decided to go with Direct TV. 
Okay, I'd always had cable. So I get DirecTV. Hmm, what's this NFL Sunday ticket? All right, I'm gonna buy this. What's this? Wow, I get every football game on a Sunday. I don't have to leave my house and I can watch whatever game I wanted. It's the first time, and I went to the first Buccaneers game in 1976 when I was living in Tampa. First time I ever remember since then not going to a live NFL game at some point during the year. That's the same thing happening to all sports. We can all sit home and watch it great on TV, and we can't catch up to the technology that, that the production companies are using for these broadcasts. The in-car audio, the gyro cams, the in-car camera, the replays, 20 different camera angles. And so what's happening is it's a lot easier to stay at home. Now for Daytona specifically, so as good as I just told you, I think I said 60% of our crowd comes from outside the state. On average, they spend five nights while they're here. That's a huge investment, right? And so you have to have a plan. You want to do that. Hmm. Sit at home. Don't have to worry about a camper or a hotel or an airline ticket. It's a lot easier to sit at home. Daytona Rising, that's really about the live experience to get you off your couch and to attend a live sporting event versus sitting at home and watching it on TV. That is the challenge. We're seeing it in the NFL. We're seeing it across all, to all forms of sport. It's about value, but more importantly, it's about competition with time, time doing something else. We're stepping up and we're putting all our chips on creating a live experience that's better than anything that we've done before to get you to come to our venue. Now, things that we do that we do well, driver intros, fan zone, get you right down on the ball field, you know, a Thunderbird flyover, things that you don't feel the same over TV, but I think we're always gonna have that push-pull with TV. I remember, and it's interesting too, about starting times of events. You know, um, you start to see uh, baseball playoff games being pushed to nighttime when they used to be during the day on a Saturday. You're starting to see really TV ratings drive a lot of it. TV rights fees are becoming the number one revenue stream for most sports properties. And so it's a little bit of a balancing act with the live gate versus TV and what they need. And so I think we're always gonna be back and forth with that. That I think is the challenge moving forward. You know, our venues are older and we don't have a chance to remake them every 20 years or so like the other sports venues. Actually, here's a good one for you guys. The Atlanta Braves baseball team, they're building a new stadium in Atlanta and on a county north of Atlanta Metro. When did their current stadium open up? 1996. 1996 for the Olympics. So that means that property is 18 years old. They're going to a new stadium only after 18 years. So there's this competition, this arms race, if you will, with these new venues to attract people to attend. And it's really difficult for us in the motorsports world to compete with that because we don't get to kind of rebuild across the street and do something different. You know, you've seen Yankee Stadium, you've seen all these venues, they're newer. And so I think that's a, that's a tough one for us. Look, we have prices for the Daytona 500, $65. So from a value perspective, I think we offer all those right elements. You can't go to the Super Bowl, you can't go to a World Series game for that, but it's more about I could sit at home and get a little bit more, and, and the second screen is gonna be a challenge too, right? So you know what the second screen is, and I, I do this. I like the PGA Tour, so I like to watch golf. It's quiet, it's peaceful, there's no concrete walls, you know, for me it's a little comfort, but I have my iPad with me, and so I have the Tour app open, and I have the TV on, so I'm enjoying a second screen experience as well. And so you don't really get to do that when you're at a venue live. And I think that's another challenge. You know, all of these mobile devices that we have kind of supplement the TV experience. And so that's gonna continue to be a challenge. I, I think what concerns me more is the generation of young people right now who are so hooked on their mobile device. Um, you guys ever see this now? I don't know if you've been to a concert or a sporting event. And, and I laugh to myself because if I go, I'm there to enjoy it myself. But what I see is half the crowd has their phone up, filming it or taking a photo. It's almost like they're really not there. They just wanted a record that they were there to share with all the other people that aren't there. Kind of, the social space to me is kind of rub your nose in it, right? I'm here and you're not, right? You check in at certain places. Here's a photo from the race I was at. You know, here, I was at this place, here's this. It's a little bit of just showing everybody where I was, but I don't know if they're enjoying it as much other than just showing people I was someplace you weren't. And, and I think that's gonna be a challenge moving forward. We believe with some of the social stuff we're adding, the amenities, the vertical, we can appeal to all of the demographics that we need. But I think live versus TV is always gonna be a challenge moving forward. And uh, it is time for another good movie. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a racing fan. I like, 
I like all sorts of racing. Um, there's a movie out there about Ayrton Senna, uh, a, a documentary about him. If you want to see one of the best racing movies ever, it's that because it's all real footage, but it plays like a movie. And some of the in-car footage and driver meetings, I would put that on y'all's list. It is fantastic. And then also, I got to share this too. There's not very many good racing books out there. I like racing books about history and, and drivers. There's a book called Go Like Hell. It's written by a guy named A.J. Bain. And it's about Ford dethroning Ferrari in sports car racing in the 60s. It's the best racing book I've ever read. It talks about Carroll Shelby and how he kind of made, made his bones versus the Ford engineers in Detroit. And he's doing it on a, on a deserted airstrip in Texas using tape and, and twine and all these things. And you got these engineers in Detroit trying to tell him what to do. And it's another great racing book about the history. It talks about Mario Andretti getting his first ride. And so that's a, a good one to put on your list. I think you'd be impressed with that. And one final question. I answered that too long, though. I'm sorry, Jay. I probably turned that into a really long answer. One more question. Who's going to finish on the, the last question? This gentleman over here. It's kind of a two-part question. Um, I'm still on the, on the subject of attendance, dovetailing on his question. Do you think there's too many races? That's the first question. Second one is... Um, I never quite understood why cup drivers are allowed to participate in Nationwide. So I don't think the season's too long, and here's why. Um, I look at other sports, and so are you a fan of, of a football team or a baseball team? Pick who's the team you're, you're a fan of. Okay. So typically when a, a schedule comes out, you probably target the good games that you like but you've got to sit through some of the games you don't like to get that package, right? And so a NASCAR race, though, at the highest level is an all-star race at every event they run. You don't have to sit through the, the, the seller, you know, the bottom teams of the ratings to get the tickets to the Yankees versus the Rays, but they make you buy the package where you have to get the, the other teams with it. But for NASCAR and the communities they go to, so whether it's Richmond or Chicago or Kansas, that's their all-star race. So that's the one time every star is in that community. And I think that's important for our fan base because not everybody gets to travel from Kansas to other properties. Um, there's an interesting debate on Cup versus, now it's called Xfinity, but would be nationwide on back and forth. I actually think it's okay. And I think, I think the young guys should have to run against the big guys and show that they can do it. We've seen a guy named Chase Elliott do really well this year. He's 18 years old, and he's putting Kyle Busch in his rearview mirror and some other folks, and I like that. I think it's a great chance for those young drivers to earn, earn it versus the big guys, and I'm okay with it. I like what NASCAR did and that the points don't apply for a championship. You have to choose which championship you're running for, so that, that's okay in my book. And, and candidly, you know, I'm out there selling tickets, so I've got to sell a ticket to that event, and it's always nice when a Tony Stewart runs in our nationwide event on a Saturday. That's okay. I, I like to promote that. So I guess I should probably get to close it down, right? No more questions for, for this group. So um, first off, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, I hope that you got a little enthusiastic about what we're doing in Daytona. Um, I think there's a lot of states in this country that would love to have a, a property that unique and really for a family to invest in their own dollars back into that property is pretty special. Um, and for me, any chance to, to talk about my experience at USF and Dean Anderson, uh, I will tell you, there are things in your life that you remember, you know, whether it was the first time I stood on the side of a car driving on two wheels or, or getting to open up Chicago and Speedway. But in my career and the kind of roller coaster we all get to ride, you know, that moment at USF really helped me chart the course. I don't think I would be here today talking to you were it not for my two years at USF. It made a huge difference for me in putting things in perspective. So with that, I want to end with one of my favorite sayings. Mario Andretti, famous race car driver, only man to ever win an F1 World Championship, an Indy 500, and a Daytona 500. Great family, too, in terms of Michael and Marco. He has a saying, if things seem like they're under control, you're just not going fast enough. <laughs> so for everybody in this room, I, I hope you keep going fast. Keep your foot on the floor. Remember, it's no fun coming in second place. You want to win, go fast, and you'll win. So with that, thank you very much.
Well, thank you for coming, and that was pretty exciting. It's like he's like a hybrid vehicle. He can just go on and on and on. Uh, is fantastic, and we're uh, very fortunate that. And I do want to let everyone know that Joey's given up his time for the next week to USF. And like I said, he's going to be spending time up in Tampa tomorrow and all weekend long. And uh, there is no fee attached. So we are very, our students were very fortunate enough to hear what you heard this morning. Um, he really inspired 100 undergrads who were half asleep. He definitely woke them up. And our current MBAs and our MBA alums really enjoyed his, his uh, talk today, too. And we really, really want to thank you. And Jason Dill from the, from the Bradenton Herald, thank you very much. Great job. And uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, Morton's Market catering a reception outside. So Joey's going to be around. Jason's going to be around. I see Bob's still around as well. Uh, and I want to thank our great student ambassadors who greeted you while you came in here. Um, and that's the reason why we operate, so thank you very much. And uh, we'll uh, get the word out about our next uh, Knowledgeable Speaker Series event coming up. And Dean Anderson, thank you very much for everything you did and getting Mr. Chitwood here tonight. It was exciting. Thank you. Thank you.